the past couple of weeks we have been dealing with the subject on the battle for the mind. And you know, beloved, there are topics in the Bible like love, for example, faith, peace. Those are topics that the more you get into them, the more you find. You can spend weeks, months, years just going through everything that the Bible has to teach us on these topics. What I've discovered in the past couple of weeks is that the battle for the mind is right, right there. There's so much that the Bible has to say. And I would like to think, so that uh, we could start on something else, that this is the final one, but I'll just let the Lord decide that. So I'm, I make no commitments for next week that we'll have a new subject. But we'll have another verse. We'll have another angle. Because the Word of God is an eternal fountain from which we can continuously draw teaching and revelation that will bless our lives and bless those around us. Amen? So, Father, in Jesus' name, we proclaim ourselves to be fertile ground. Not only here, but through Facebook and through YouTube, Lord. In the name of Jesus, you know our needs. You know our thoughts, our desires, and our circumstances. And so be glorified in Jesus' name. Uh, many years ago, <clears throat> I remember a commercial, I'm sure you do as well, from an organization called the United Negro College Fund, an organization that raises funds for scholarships for African Americans. They had a commercial to advertise its scholarship program with a slogan that I'll never forget. It ended by saying, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Anybody remember that? And that message was not just for a particular community, it's for all of us. The importance of education is what they're stressing and the need to help others to be able to achieve it. But that slogan, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, is a powerful truth. And by the way... God did not give us a mind just for show and tell. He gave us a mind because he himself has one. And he created us in his image. So that if God thinks, so do we. And by the way, when the Bible tells us in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, uh, that word is translated from the Greek logos, from where, where we get logo. And logos literally means the expression of a thought. The expression of a thought. So it lets us know in the original languages that God is a thinking God. And that when he speaks, what he speaks is an expression, an audible expression of what he is thinking in his mind. And so are we. Every time we speak, we are expressing what we're thinking. We're also expressing what we are feeling. Because out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth speaks. So you want to get to know somebody without hacking their computers? Or, you know, doing blood samples or DNA tests? Sit down and listen to them for a while. And you'll get a, a picture of what's on the inside. Now, we must utilize the mind that God has given us, and in the days that we're living in, it may be easier to let technology think for you. I remember a, a funny story of a, of a dear friend, a minister who lives in New York now. He told me that uh, he was having an issue with a math problem in school, and he had a calculator next to him. And he started accessing the calculator to help him solve the math problem. And his grandfather, who was an uh, old school, he grabbed the calculator, threw it against the wall. He says, don't use that. Use your head. I know that seems cruel. 
maybe to the 21st century. But even though there may be calculus problems and trigonometry that you must have to use a calculator to be able to solve, I do applaud the grandfather's principle in the sense of God gave us something that we need to stimulate its use. Because if you hand over your thoughts to technology or you pay someone else to think for you or you rely on someone or something else to think for you, you will be controlled by whoever or whatever you relinquish that control to. Somebody in here with me? Don't give your mind over to social media or news media because the hap what happens is that we become controlled and the way things are spinned and narrated it becomes a reality for you whether it's true or not that's why you've got to control your thoughts and you have got to be careful what influences are accessing the door of your soul which is your mind Yes, it's easier to pay someone else to think for you. Yes, it's easier to have technology think for you. But what did God give you a mind for? He gave you intelligence. And I just want to say that every human being upon the face of the earth, regardless of where they come from or who they are, has been given intelligence. We don't use our intelligence for the same thing. Somebody may be inclined towards mathematics. Somebody may be inclined to science. Somebody may be inclined to sports. So we all use intelligence for different things because we all have different interests. That does not eliminate the fact that you are an intelligent being created in the image of an intelligent God. So if anybody in your life ever told you that you were dumb, Cancel that word. Snip it out of your memory. Throw it in the garbage. You are an intelligent human being created in the image of an all-knowing God. But sometimes if we choose not to use that ability, that intelligence that God has given all human beings, that's where the crisis comes. Not because we don't have it, but because we choose not to use it. And so, God wants you to think for yourself. Can you tell somebody and say, God wants you to think for yourself? Now, I know we trust people, we trust family members, and we trust uh, our church family, and we trust neighbors and friends and stuff like that, but don't let anyone else take over your mind to the point of control because one of the branches of witchcraft is manipulation and people who exert mind control are exerting witchcraft they're manipulating the minds of others for gain whether it be financial whether it be a power trip whatever it is we have to be very careful we cannot be ignorant of the enemy's devices and so You've got to think for yourself. I want to share real quick with you today that we should not let external circumstances control your internal thoughts. i say that again. Don't let external circumstances control your internal thoughts. There are things you may not be able to control around you. But there's one thing you can control. Yourself. You cannot control sometimes what others do, and you cannot control sometimes what others say, but you can control your reactions to it. You can control your tongue, as difficult as that may be. You can control your mind. You can control your desires. One of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So we cannot sometimes control circumstances around us, but we can control ourselves. And so I want to reference a well-known story that you know of, and I'm not going to repeat it completely, but I just want to remind you about Joseph. Joseph illustrates to us what it is to keep your thoughts under control 
regardless of external circumstances. Let's just quickly rehash. The betrayal of his brothers. The false accusation of his boss. And the forgotten promise of a prison mate were not enough to make him forget the dream God had given him. I want to repeat that so it sinks into your spirit. He had a dream. He had a revelation. He had a witness from God concerning his future. And it was ingrained in his mind and in his heart. And what others did to him was not enough to extract that dream out of him. It was not enough to unroot the faith in the God that had promised him a blessed future. And so he is a reference point for us that we should not let the outside change what God has convicted you of on the inside. Yes, we're tempted to forget promises. We're tempted to forget what God has said in his word when things that are on the outside don't align or seem to confirm what we have in our spirit. But we can't let the outside control the inside. And so the Bible reveals what Joseph's mindset was concerning his circumstances. I just want to read first Genesis 39.9. We got to get into this, beloved, because I don't remember so much psychological warfare in my short history of life. We are undergoing a, an intentional war for the mind. And we've got to fight it with the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but powerful in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Genesis 39.9. Now, as you leave that verse up there, this would be tough for any young man or any man to endure. All the men here, be honest and say amen. This is a young man who has been placed in a unique position as the administrator of Potiphar's house. Potiphar has entrusted everything to him except for his wife. And now the wife looks on Joseph and Joseph catches her eye. And she says, there's nobody here but us. Let's go have a party. There's no surveillance. There's no hidden cameras. There's no social media. Nobody else there. The only person that would have ever known if something had gone on, was the very person that Joseph references. The all-knowing, all-seeing, omniscient God. And observe his mindset. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. Now, here is where the revelation of Joseph's mindset comes in. How then could I do such a wicked thing? Let me, let me put, press the pause button right there. Do you see how Joseph describes... Oh, God, I'm getting in trouble here. Do you see how Joseph describes... Fornication? I know society sugarcoats it and says it's okay. I just want to repeat what the word says and what Joseph said. Is that okay? All right. Joseph said, how then could I do such a wicked thing? Yes, it'll be pleasurable. Yes, it'll be an experience the mind will never forget. But Joseph says, it's wicked. Because I'm betraying the trust that my boss has put in me. And above all things, look what he says, and sin 
against God. Now Moses had not appeared on the scene and the law had not been given, yet Joseph already knew what he should and should not do because God gave you something called a conscience. Some people want to lose the, use those legalistic out clauses. Oh, the Bible doesn't say this. Oh, the Bible doesn't say that. If there is a witness in your spirit that you should not say this or do this, that's the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your mind testifying to you that that is not God's will for you to say or behave in that manner. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. You don't have to have a Bible verse for it. The last, the last letters of Scripture were written 2,000 years ago. There's a lot of stuff that's not covered. They're covered by extension, by interpretation, by application, and some things you will not for figure out. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. To guide us to all truth and all righteousness. So when you don't have a verse for it, He'll let you know if it's okay or if it's not okay. Somebody in here with me? Joseph didn't want to take advantage of Potiphar's wife first and foremost because it was a sin against God. Joseph's primary concern was his fear or respect for God and the honor due to his master. What are the motives behind what you do or don't do? Oh, I don't. I don't want the catalyst board to find out. Shh, shh don't, don't, no, no, don't, 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 don't let Pastor Joel know. No problem. Hakuna Matara. I don't have to know. The church doesn't have to know. God knows. I'm not the one who blesses you or curses you. I'm not the one who holds you accountable. All right? So, so I'm not there. The board's not there. The leadership's not there. The, the church family's not there. But God is. The Holy Spirit is. He sees. He knows. He hears. The CIA. Celestial Intelligence Agency. Come on, somebody. They know everything that we do. Say, hallelujah. What are the motives? Your primary motive should be pleasing the Father. Paul said in Colossians 3.17, I don't have it here, but it says, everything that you do by word or deed, let it be to the glory of God through the name of Jesus, giving thanks through Christ to him. Let nothing done, let nothing be done for contentiousness or vainglory. Nothing for boasting and nothing to cause strife or division. We should have clear motives in everything that we do and say. It should all point upward to the glory of God. If it doesn't glorify, if it doesn't glorify God, don't do it and don't say it. Easy. How about that? Now, Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, oh Lord, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Fasten your seatbelts. Joseph did not hold a grudge against his brothers because he understood that God had allowed all this pain for a purpose. Doesn't that make forgiveness easier? Come on, somebody in here. I'm not overstepping my bounds. I got permission from the Holy Spirit to get into your personal life. God's going somewhere with this. He's touching some delicate areas. You cannot hold a grudge 
for something that was allowed sovereignly by God to improve you. <laughs> if God allowed it sovereignly to occur and it ended up improving you, bringing glory to God and bringing growth to your spiritual and emotional and even physical life, you have no jurisdiction, no permission, no authority, no right to hold grudges against what someone did or said if God allowed it to make your life better. I'm not saying it didn't hurt. I'm not saying it was right. I'm not justifying actions or deeds. But beloved, when you see things from macro level, you can see more from a higher standpoint than you can from a lower standpoint. My father-in-law was in Osceola Regional Hospital several years ago. He was on the fourth floor. And, and, and when you stand right there in the first floor of Osceola Regional, all you can do is just look across the street to some doctor's offices over there on Oak Commons. When I went to the fourth floor and looked out, I could see the McDonald's from 192 all the way across. Tell somebody, say, the higher you go, the more you can see. And as long as we see things from a first floor level, we're going to hold grudges, we're going to be upset, we can't forgive, and we can't forget. But when you go up higher, come on somebody, help me preach in here. When you go up higher and you see things from God's perspective, you say, oh, that's all right. No matter what you said, no matter what you did, no matter what you intended, God turned it around and caused me to be blessed. Somebody help me in here. I can't hold a grudge. He allowed it. That doesn't mean we like it. That doesn't mean that we applaud the actions of the individual. That doesn't mean that you don't lovingly correct and call that person to repentance. But in the grand scheme of things, if he allowed it for your blessing, you can't hold a grudge because God had his hand in it. When you have a renewed mind, you analyze things from God's perspective. That's why we need the metamorphosis, transformed by the renewing of the mind. That's why we need to tear down the strongholds of our carnal thinking. Because once, once we have grasped the mind of Christ to the Holy Spirit, now we're seeing things from a different view. We have a bird's eye view. The circumstances that looked big on the first level now look small from God's level. And then you can properly manage the different issues in your life. Number two, let your convictions change your surroundings. I said this before, but I'll repeat it. We must ask God to make us thermostats instead of thermometers. Thermometers measure the ambient temperature. Thermostats change the ambient temperature. What do we do in here when one of you complains that it's too cold? We go over there to the two back there, the one back here, or the two in the lobby, and we start increasing the temperature. What do we do when it's hot? And if you're me, it's always hot. You go and you reduce the temperature. Because you know that the thermostat has the capacity to change the ambiance around you. Thermometers don't. Thermometers complain. Thermostats act. Somebody chew on that for a second. Thermometers complain. Thermostats act. So ask, ask your neighbor, which one are you? Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. We're called to be thermostats. So I want to remind you of a well-known story, Acts 16, 25. Acts 16, 25. About midnight, 
Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas sang hymns at midnight while being imprisoned, beaten, and their feet were in the stocks. How could they do this? I suggest to you that Paul was reminded of the declaration uttered by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 26, verse 3 of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse number 3, I want you to see what the prophet Isaiah uttered. Hallelujah. Let me read it for you. Thank you, Jesus. In Isaiah 26, 3, it says, The man whose heart is unmoved, you will keep in peace. Well, actually, let's use the NIV. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are because they... Leave that verse up there. You will keep in perfect peace, perfect shalom, those whose minds are steadfast, firm, stable. Why are their minds firm? And stable and steadfast because they trust in you so when you place your trust in God your mind becomes stabilized steadfast unmovable always abiding in the work of God and as a result you live in a state of peace you your circumstances may not be peaceful but you can be full of peace. I believe that scripture was right there in the mind of Paul. In the darkness, there was no electricity, there was no air conditioning. As horrible as prisons may be, they have a lot of perks today that previous generations did not have. The same Paul would later write to the church. He found it in this very city because Paul was imprisoned in Philippi. And later he writes to the Philippian church, interestingly, and he utters a promise to them in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, look what he says. And the peace of God which transcends all will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what he experienced in Philippi, he now reminds the church that he founded with the very experience of peace that surpasses human understanding but is in line with divine understanding. And that's why he says in verse 8, he gives them a list, a laundry list of things to think about. Which should be our thinking as well. In verse number 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So whenever, oh dear, the mortgage is due. Oh dear, the car payment is due. Oh dear, here comes a negative report from the doctor. Oh dear, look at this, look at that, from, look at the other. Instead of dwelling on the negative, Paul says, think about whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. I'm not telling you to deny reality. I'm telling you to rise above it. 
The eagle does not deny the fact that there's a storm blowing around it. But uh, zoologists say they, they rise above the turbulence. It's there, but they're above it. Can somebody rise above the turbulence? You may have issues, you may have problems, but if you have a mind that is set in God, you can rise above the situation. Paul and Silas' attitudes changed their surroundings, not the other way around. So, as much as you love people, sometimes you've got to get disconnected and get away from people who are always thinking and speaking negatively. Love them, pray for them, lay hands on them, and excuse yourself from their presence. I love you, I'm here for you, I'll serve you, I'll support you, I'll pray for you, and I'm sorry, but I got things to do. What you got to do? I got to think on what's right, what's noble, what's true, what's praiseworthy, What's admirable? I got no time to think about what can't be done when I got a God that can do anything. Hallelujah. Love, support, pray. But they'll drag you down. And listen, beloved, some people get upset with others because others progress. And then envy and hatred starts rising. Well, why are you and not me? It's not an issue of somebody being better. It's an issue of somebody using faith. It's very simple. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't love you more than me or me love, more lo uh, love me more than you. He is no respecter of persons. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. I can't get upset at you for progressing in victory. Because you chose to believe what God has said while I chose to remain in unbelief. I can't fault you for growing in the spirit and in faith if you have progressed in your prayer life and gotten closer to God while I'm sitting here through Netflix wasting hours upon hours. I, oh, I'm just, I just got myself in trouble. If you and I are 35 years old, you know, and you now you, you got yourself married and got kids and you're progressing forward and I'm here still PlayStation nine hours a day, I'm getting myself in trouble, aren't I? You cannot become envious or hate someone who's chosen to progress and do something with their lives because they've taken their minds and reworked it and put it to use. They took the intelligence God blessed them with and they put it to use. And if we do the same, we'll get the results as well. Oh, Lord, help me. Whew. I don't know if I can say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. Sometimes it's not an issue of, of opportunity. It's an issue of attitude. I'm going to repeat it again. With a risk that you might not want to say hi after service. Sometimes it's not an issue of, of opportunity. It's an issue of attitude. I have intelligence and so do you. I have a mind and so do you. What we choose to do with it makes a difference. Hallelujah. So Paul and Silas' attitudes change the surroundings. Not the other way around. There's a contrast that we find between David and Paul. I'm rounding the corner here to the end. Before David enters the cave of Adullam to hide from King Saul, he wrote Psalms 34. Which in verse 1 of Psalms 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth good times and bad times he did not specify what type of times he just says at all times 
I will bless the Lord and his praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Right? That's before he went into the Adullam cave. But in the cave, under the persecution of King Saul, he writes another psalm. He's gone through a, a season of being persecuted and followed and, and scrutinized. And now the tone changes. And he writes Psalms 142. And in verse 7, look what he says. Psalms 142, verse 7. Notice how he changes his tone. Before entering in the Adullam cave, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Now in the cave, under persecution, under duress, under stress, look what he, look what he says. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. So notice that he promises before entering into the cave unconditional, continuous praise. Now circumstances have gotten a little bit more difficult to deal with. And now from unconditional, he goes to conditional. Set me free from this prison that I may praise your name. Wait a minute. You said before I, you will bless the Lord at all times. Thank you, Lourdes. She asked the question. What happened? How did you go from unconditional to conditional? How did you go from saying I will bless him at all times to now saying if you do this, then I will do that? Set me free and I'll praise you. Heal me and I'll praise you. Give me that promotion and I'll praise you. Give me taxes in the, within the next week expeditiously. I don't care if they say three weeks. I get it this week, you're going to see what I'm going to do with that. I'm going to sow a seed. <laughs> so, so, see, when we, when we lack faith, beloved... I know th this is a little bit tough, but if we lack faith, we're going to step into the conditional relationship with God. Do this, then I will do. If you do, then I will do. When you do, then I will do. So we place conditions on a relationship because we become reactionary. We wait for him to do, and then we respond to what he does or what he doesn't do. That's why you see people, they're happy when he does, but they're miserable when he does not do. And David says in Psalms 34, I will bless the Lord at all times, which means when he does, I will bless you. And when he doesn't, I'll bless you anyways. I'll bless you in the good times, and I will bless you in the bad times. But now the circumstances have changed his faith. And he puts a condition. Take me out of here. And then I'll fulfill the promise I made to you before I got in here. Deliver me first. And then I will praise you. Is what he's saying. Now notice. Paul did the total opposite. When you have a renewed mind. When you have undergone metamorphosis in your understanding. When you have the mind of Christ. Which is sure and secure in the yes and the amen of the Father. In the steadfast promises of the word. In God's power and ability to do exceeding abundantly what you can ask or imagine. When you have that mind... You don't have to wait for God to do. You're not a thermometer measuring the temperature of the ambiance. You're a thermostat ready to change the circumstances around you. Because in the case of Paul, who was imprisoned, he did the total opposite. He opted to praise first and then he was delivered. Renewed minds operate in renewed strategies 
I hope there's somebody here today ready, able, and willing to change from thermometer to thermostat so that the things around you can start to change. But things around us will not start to change until we change. So stop looking to your left and stop looking to your right or behind you in front of you waiting for someone else to change when the Lord is wanting to get a hold of my mind and yours so we may change. And then when we change, everything around us will start to change. Renewed minds operate in renewed strategies. Our conduct is a reflection of our thoughts. A renewed mind will produce a renewed conduct, which will be evidenced by how we react to the circumstances that we face. In this battle for the mind, let's remember that we have the helmet of salvation. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit as agents of change. Again, we stress, if you want to see things change, the first change has to occur in your mind. As we finish, place yourself mentally in your imagination in that prison in Philippi. It's dark, it's smelly, it's muggy, and it's miserable. It's depressing. And here's these two men. They were beaten, they feet in the stocks. They were imprisoned for Casting a soothsaying demon out of a young lady. And all of a sudden at midnight, they say, you know what? It's too quiet in here. <laughs> Let's start giving God some praise and glory. And since Psalms 22 says that he inhabits the praises of his people. That word inhabit in the Hebrew means to sit. God grabs an audience in the midst of the praises of his people. Sits in our praise. Inhabits it. And things start to happen. And here's Paul and Silas. And I don't know what they were singing. If they were uh, integrity worship or they were singing Don Moen songs or they were you know, singing Mary, Mary, make the cycles on my feet so I can dance. Uh, I don't know what they were singing. But when they began to sing and give God praise, God shook the prison down, the gates were open, the shackles came off, and they were delivered because they did not put a condition on the praise. They praised and then God acted. Maybe if we tried things differently, instead of trying to get something from God, give something to God. And as a result, you'll get back, pressed down, shaken together. Hallelujah. I don't praise him to get something from him. I praise him because I love him. I praise him because he's worthy. I praise him because he's glorious. And so, beloved, as we move forward, we must undergo a metamorphosis in our minds. Would you please stand? When you have a renewed mind, opportunities come that seem wonderful. And you look at them from God's view and say, mm, no thank you. My wife and I received an email a couple of weeks back from a, a car dealership. He said, Mr. and Mrs. Aviles, we need to get rid of some 2023 models. We're offering you 0% for 60 months. And I said, hmm, 0%, no interest. But see, that 0% is not comparable to the zero monthly payment for a car that's paid off. So you take one zero, compare it to another zero, and you say, Lord, thank you. I'll stay with what I have. Because you have a renewed mind that doesn't have to go after everything that is offered. Father, help us in the midst of our trying circumstances, in the midst of our temptations, 
in the midst of our difficulties. Help us to have a renewed mind that will see things from your perspective. Father, I ask that if there's anybody here today, Lord, that, that is having a struggle with forgiving somebody, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, even a church member, that somehow, some way, during the stages of life, offended them, whether verbally, emotionally, or even physically. Lord, we do not justify nor applaud the incorrect deeds of others. But we do say, you have been merciful with us. And if in your sovereignty you allowed it to happen and it has turned out for the good, we will hold no grudges. We will forgive as you have forgiven us. Father, we also pray that you help us, Lord, to be changers of atmospheres. Help us, Lord, to not just dwell on what's going on around us, but to be a driving force of change. To not just see and analyze the circumstances, but look for solutions in order to solve problems, change circumstances for the glory of your name. Father, renew our thoughts, renew our minds to the Holy Spirit. We submit unto your word. We submit unto your power. And we humbly ask that you would touch our minds and transform the way we think. So that we may prove what is your good and perfect and acceptable will. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. You know that the uh, it, Bible records that when the Israelites went to war, uh, they would clap their hands. They would clap their hands. But when they won the war, they would also clap their hands. So why don't we give a win in the war clap of hands. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. Lift it up to God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word has been powerful and real to us, O oh God. And I pray that as it's gone forth, that it will not return void, O oh Lord. But it, it does that which you have proposed it to do, Lord. Let's take it with us, Father. And, and I pray that we would apply it now. Father, that we have observed it, we have interpreted it, Lord. We have, and now we can apply that word to our lives in the name of Jesus. Father, go with us. As always, we are dismissed from here, but not from your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. amen. Greet each other in the name of the Lord.